Today, we're going to talk with three YouTube powerhouses on the subject of marketing to fitness fanatics. Our guests have a combined total of 4.5 million subscribers. So actually, you know, beyond fitness, there's going to be some great YouTube lessons learned here that will apply to marketers and anyone that wants to be a, a YouTube influencer alike. So as a reminder, we're about how-to content, not fluff. Please ask questions on the right-hand side with a slash Q. You can also tweet out the blab on the left-hand side. Please do that a couple of times throughout the uh, throughout the show. And then subscribe to the guests and give them props when they're answering questions that you like. And if you don't like them, then just let them know about it in the content, uh, the comment section on the right-hand side. So let me introduce my two guests that are here now. And uh, when Scott Herman joins, we'll introduce him. But we've got Abel James of Fat Burning Man, catchy title there. He's got his own show on YouTube where he educates people like me on how to stay lean and muscular. And at my age, it's getting harder and harder every year. Uh, and then we have Daniel Rose of Six Pack Shortcuts, where they really focused on, you guessed it, getting six pack abs. I have no idea. I'm still trying. I'm, I'm at four trying to get six. I can't get to six. Uh, but I do have to ask you, Dan, before we kick off, is there such a thing as eight pack abs? <laughs> there is. It's uh, it's pretty tough to get, and it's a little bit dependent on genetics. Um, anybody can get six pack abs, but eight pack abs are possible. Just uh, tough to get and little ge uh, genetics dependent. Okay, so is your next show going to be called Eight Pack Abs? Or your next channel? Is it <laughs> we, we always talked about that, like someone trying to top us by doing like eight pack shortcuts. Um, I, I think for the average guy, like six pack abs are aspirational enough. Though. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm finding it hard at six, not my twenties, <laughs> but now uh, in my early forties, it's it's hard. So let's kick things off. Hey, Abel, who are the people that are watching these vi these fitness videos on YouTube? Who are these people? Why why are there so many people out there watching them? That's a great question because it covers such a large demographic. You, I, I think the stereotypical YouTube watcher has changed a lot in the past couple of years. I think a lot of people will agree about that. It used to be, you know, kind of younger, more tech savvy people, especially when uh, a lot of us were getting started in the fitness marketing space. But these days, you know, my uh, my wife's dad, he's watching YouTube all the time on his TV. So the boomers are starting to get involved. It's, it's really changed a lot. It's interesting. Okay. And Daniel, I mean, are they women or men or who's watching your channel? Do you have any idea? Um, in the beginning, when we first started off, it was mostly younger guys. And a lot of people get the misconception it's still that way because in the comments, it's mostly younger guys. But right now, it's actually um, pretty evenly by age. And our channel is mostly men. Um, as far as like who's watching overall, though, um, a lot of people don't realize that it is really literally everybody, uh, men and women of all ages, um, older people especially are starting to get much more involved. Uh, one mistake that I do think people make is um, when, when they do realize is everybody's trying to make a channel for everybody. Um, but I would say even though it is everybody on there, you have to pick a segment of, of everybody that you do market to. True. And, and Daniel or, you know, Abel, if you want to jump in, I mean, what <laughs> – what market is being served here? Why why haven't other people exploited this on TV or, or other channels? What is it that you guys are doing that historically or traditionally wasn't done before? I mean, me personally, I think the biggest mistake that big brands are making when they go onto YouTube is they think because it's video, they can just put their TV commercials or like the stuff they put on TV on YouTube. Um, and it doesn't really work that way. Even though it's both video, YouTube, I feel, is a really unique medium, and it kind of requires a different approach. Um, the, the, the biggest difference, I think, is that um, people need a little bit more of a personal connection. On TV, it's more like you're broadcasting worlds. On YouTube, it's a lot more like um, like you're their friend. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, the manager himself that's his friend. I mean, I'm not, I'm not personally on the YouTube channel, but somebody needs to be on there making that personal connection. Abel, do you agree? I would totally echo that. You know, being experienced in both traditional media and internet media, it is a fundamentally different thing, how you connect with people, how you present yourself. And when you're going out there on the internet, it, Dan's right, it's all about having that personal connection, talking about your dog, being totally real about how bad your day is. It's not about, you know, that thing where you're shined up with a bunch of makeup, you're kind of talking in just one-liners over and over again, which is kind of the alternative that we're seeing in short form. So I think YouTube is is... It can be long form, and that's what a lot of my content is. But the, the main difference is that you can have targeted short and medium form 
that people are searching for specifically. So you can have very specific videos led by a particular personality that, that they connect with. But Dan, you uh, you focus just on six pack abs. I'm just, I mean, your team is right. I don't know how you guys could produce such high quality content over a long period of time about one subject matter. I mean, have you just discovered that six pack abs are what all men and women are looking for? Um, yeah, it has been a, actually a lot of a challenge to like keep the channel focused over time. It's been real tempting to just do women stuff and like stuff for everybody. Um, kind of the way we found it though, is when we were first starting the channel, it was just, it was just me and Mike in the apartment where we were first starting off. Um, back at that time, even producing like one video a week was kind of a challenge and, you know, keeping everything focused on six pack ads wasn't challenging at all. Um, we kind of, the approach that we've taken is, um, in the very beginning of the channel, if you look back on our old videos, we were the most focused on six pack abs and we basically slowly diversified outside of that over time. Um, but we've only, um, we've only done that once we kind of, um, uh, it become the top channel for six pack abs and we expanded beyond that uh, kind of the approach that we took is at first it was all about ab training all about how to get six pack abs then we slowly kind of diversified into bodybuilding type workouts and, and now we're more general like men's fitness type workouts so um there, there's always six pack abs is kind of the main kind of content but i do think that um once you master a small niche you should eventually look to expand beyond that okay and a question came in about how do you grow your audience when all of your videos are similar? I mean, how did you get the 3.6 million subscribers? That's unbelievable. We're just doing <laughs> six pack abs. I'm going to do eight pack abs. I yeah, that's, that's a really good question, actually. And um, the, the biggest key for us was um, I, I, there was a lot on the organic side and there was a lot on the advertising side. But basically, it was using advertising and the organic side together. Um, on the advertising side, a lot of what we would do is um, – the biggest key to building our channel on the advertising side was uh, we're running a lot of commercials and those commercials are really good for making sales. But in terms of getting people to subscribe to the channel, um, it usually doesn't work that well if you just run a commercial. But one thing that we would do is we would advertise our organic videos a lot. Um, and as a marketer, that was a little bit uh, um, of a chance for me to take because a lot of times the um, the ROI on that would not be immediate. Uh, however, it would lead to a lot of people subscribing to the channel. And even though it was a little bit more difficult to measure, um, we do believe that eventually led to a lot more sales. So, um, I, I mean, obviously there was a lot of things going into it on the organic and the advertising side, but if I had to pick one single thing, I would say advertising organic videos that people had a good response to, uh, that was one of the biggest keys for us. Okay. Awesome. All right. We're going to go to the next topic here. You know, Abel, let's start with you. What makes you so popular on YouTube? What are you doing that say maybe your competitors are not? I, I think it's probably personality. I mean, when I watch you guys, I'm, I'm drawn in by your personalities. I want to, I want to learn more. Uh, but I'm also interested in how you guys will be able to build that distribution. And I, I know Daniel's already answered that somewhat, but um, Abel, why don't, why don't you kick that off? Yeah, so the difference between, or one of the differences between what Daniel's doing and what I'm doing is that pretty much everything I'm doing in the entire history in any form has been through organic traffic. And what that means for people watching, it means that I'm not paying for traffic. People are coming for one reason or another and finding you and hopefully sticking with you. So. For me, it's uh, it's really been about consistency. A lot of people, they're just like, oh, I hear YouTube's hot right now, or I think podcasts are hot right now, so I'm gonna start one. You need to be a lot more strategic with the way that you think about it, because this is really a lifetime commitment. If all of a sudden you're putting out you know, 80 YouTube videos one week, and then you're not putting out more than a half dozen the next week, it's hard for people to really resonate with that if you're trying to grow organically. The strategy changes, though, if you're doing paid traffic. Yeah. And real quickly, I want to introduce Scott Herman of Scott Herman Fitness. He's he's more of a 100% natural approach to getting fit. He's got some great helpful videos and tips, uh, all made with you know regular guys like me who struggle every single day with this. So Scott, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sorry, I had a had a few computer issues. Um, I I had the wrong link, and now I'm here. Oh, you had the wrong link. Okay, well that's fine. You're here now. You're you're not too late. Uh, but I'm gonna throw one to you right away, and I think you can answer this pretty readily. What makes you so popular on YouTube? And, and I was telling that uh, Daniel and Abel, I think a lot of it's your personality. Um, but I, I think it's my see. stunning good looks, to be honest. I think people just resonate with the jawline, you know, nice hair. Sure. Just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I, I started off on YouTube 2009, and my, my biggest thing, and the reason why I started my channel was because I just wanted to help people. I had been living in New York for about a year and a half and after spending a lifetime in the gym, training, helping people out and being away from that for so long, I just needed like, I just needed to touch people, you know, I needed to reach out to people. And so 
I just started doing cheesy videos in my, my small apartment in New York and I started to build a really solid connection with my audience because I would literally come home, you know, every single day and spend eight to 10 hours and I would go, I'd go from start to finish from video one, you know, and I probably had like 30 videos at the time and I would just go through every single comment and just keep going back and go through every single comment and making sure I was answering questions and that's a, a big reason as to why I'm even so well known now is people, they know if they leave a comment that they're probably going to get a response whether they're trolling or actually asking a question. But don't you think a lot of people do that, Scott, on YouTube and they're not getting the response that the rest of that you three are getting? There's got to be some other ingredient or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just a lot of hard um, years. Well, I th obviously, you know, you got to come across as a genuine person. People can tell when you're trying to actually help others. Um, I will go out. Of, I will say that not a lot of big YouTubers respond to comments. I would probably say that I'm like one of, you know, two that probably actually get down there and do it. I mean, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about. And I talk to fans at events and they're like, oh, so-and-so doesn't respond to comments because he's so busy. I'm like, you think I'm not busy? Like, it's an excuse because they don't care. If you if you really care about your community, you know, and you got some kid who says, I'm 15 years old and I want to build muscle and my mom says protein shakes are bad. It's like, how can you not respond to that? How can you not want to like be like hey tell your mom to watch this video you know what i mean like how can you not want to help that person and that's what really shines through and i'm sure you guys can agree with me right daniel what do you think what, what's your team think about that whole you know getting popular on youtube and and how you're able to do it and and uh your distribution strategy around that yeah i think what scott said is definitely dead on right there um we haven't been the best of the ads with responding to comments but we've actually put in the system where we're going to have responses pretty soon and i do think it is important to have uh interaction to get more and more organic views uh here's one other thing though i think is real important too is that um what we've noticed is that uh th there's kind of um uh, a difference in the audience versus the people who interact on youtube um right now a, a big misconception about our channel like i was saying before is that it's all like younger guys um, but actually, a lot of the customers now are older guys. Uh, one thing that we found, though, is that older guys typically don't interact as much on YouTube. Um, so what we found is that it is worthwhile sometimes um, advertising our organic videos to younger guys, even though they don't really buy as much, just because they're the ones who are really going to post it on their Facebook page and share it and leave those comments and interact, interact with each other in the comments. Um, so I would say that's another key, too, just making sure you do have that younger demographic who may not have the money to buy your stuff, but will share it with all their friends. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's really important too, especially with the young people. You know, they're, they're, YouTube is great, and I kind of miss the old days. You know, a lot of my community called me like the OG because I've been there for so long. And I, I, you know, I miss the days where I could upload a how to video and people be like, yes, a how to video. Now there's so many videos on YouTube that it, I find that it's really hard for, you know, even if you're an experienced lifter to find routines or information that you know, that's quality and it's actually going to help you, you know, and, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I have my website is because at least when members are on my site and they're looking for a new routine or a new exercise or an article, you know, they know it's going to be quality. You know, you could search like, you know, chest on YouTube and probably have to go through like 15 videos before you find a workout that's, you know, actually works, you know, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people on there, a lot of people trying to learn, a lot of people trying to get their names out there, but you know, guys like us, you know, we really quality is number one for us. So we want to make sure that these the content is is up to par with what's actually going to help people. You know, do you guys agree? Yeah, I would say so definitely. And I think Scott brings up a real good point where there's so many um, general workouts out there. Like, for example, like he brought out a chest workout. I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of chest workouts. If you just upload another chest workout, you're probably not going to get anywhere. Um, but for somebody with a smaller channel, what I'd recommend is trying to do a very specialized niche type of chest workout. Um, for example, maybe something with uh, cables or something for your inner chest or something something you yeah, need yes. to generic chest workout. And if you can get the best content for um, one specific niche type of chest workout, then you can try to make a bigger one. Okay. Yeah, nowadays it's, it's more about tips on how to enhance things as opposed to a full routine. I mean, I'll spend four or five hours filming and editing a, a routine and it'll, it'll do okay. And then I spend two minutes talking about a quick tip, like you said, to, to target the middle of the chest. And it's like, boom, you know, explodes with views because it's just a simple, quick tip that people want. Yeah, very niche. -y. Okay, let's go to the next. This is, we're speaking to marketers on this question, okay? 
what types of campaigns will you do for brands and what types will you not? Let's just say, you know, you're approached tomorrow by somebody watching this video and they ask you to do X. What what would you want to do and what wouldn't you want to do? Let's start with Abel. It has to be a product that I would use at home. It has to be something that is really part of my life because you see a lot of people especially on traditional media that in the past they've been able to kind of just fling whatever was available whatever company came to them and they didn't lose a lot of credibility i think one of the biggest and most important things about new media is that you need to be a real person so the second that you're promoting something that you don't truly believe in you know some ab roller or crazy supplement that you know doesn't work or whatever hey ab rollers are awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I get a lot of comments from people just saying, like, I'm so glad that you don't advertise all of that junk. And I do, you know, promote certain things and we create a lot of our own products. So we're promoting a lot of the time. We are doing marketing, but it's very specific. And it has to be things that are in my cabinet, things that I truly believe in, things that I use all the time. So whatever the face of your business is, they need to come across and, and hopefully actually do it themselves really making whatever that product is a part of their life. I agree 100% Abel and it, it can be tough too. You know, it, it's actually funny you asked that question because I had a, I had a rough week with a product that I was talking about that I actually really enjoy. And you know, so the week before I was working with a product called sculpt and it's a body fat tester. I mean, in, in the fitness space, a body fat tester, it's pretty standard, you know, it measures your body fat, you know, you would expect to see something like that. And so I have been working with this other company called Think. And what it does is it's in, in a nutshell is it's a mechanism that you put on your forehead and it has like a circuit board that sticks to your forehead and goes to the back of your neck. And it can help basically, you know, help you calm, calm yourself down or get re-energized and get refocused. You know, and there's a lot of science behind that. I won't get into it. But anyways, you know, Erica, my wife, we tested the product for like three months to make sure that the science was there and the technology was there. And it actually worked for us, you know, and so I had made a video outlining all the things I thought were so amazing about it, you know, and I get really excited and enthusiastic when I find things I like. And also, I, I don't do a lot of reviews on products. And usually when I do a review, it's, it's a product that I like because I'm not a review channel. So I won't just grab anything and talk about it. Usually if I'm doing something with a product, it's a company that I have, I'm invested in, you know. And so I tested this product for like three months and then I was like, okay. I want to work with you guys, but it's almost like when you have an when you have an idea of something you want to work with that's kind of outside the fitness space. So like for example, the body fat tests are very well accepted. It tests your body fat. We've seen this before. But when you bring something new in and it does something that you've never really seen before, you know, I found people coming at me like, "Oh, you know, you're a sellout. You're this. You're that." And I'm like, "Did you not see in the video where I said I tested it for three months?" If I, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't be making a video about it because I'm not going to ruin my credibility. And you're so right, Abel. Like, it has to be stuff that you use in your lifestyle. And sometimes, you know, you're going to have a hard time getting that message across if it's something new. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I really believe in this product. And so I talk about it and I'm going through every single question. And some people are like, why are you getting defensive? Like, I'm not getting defensive. It's just you guys are attacking my pride as like this person who's been here for seven years giving you free content answering your questions and now you're calling me a liar over a video of something i like it's like you know you gotta stick up for yourself for products too do you agree yeah i would say um i think the biggest thing just like you guys said like if it, i find like i also agree i think it's a bad idea to promote things that you or your trainers aren't personally using yourself um, Sculpt is one of the few fitness sponsorships that we've done, but uh, the biggest thing that we found in terms of uh, sponsored videos is um, our best sponsors have actually been outside the fitness industry. Um, uh, probably like our number one sponsor who's bought the most sponsored videos is audible.com. Um, yeah, anyone who's looking for a sponsor for their channel, they're an excellent, excellent sponsor. Um, I, I, I would just say the, downloaded their app, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the good thing about Audible is that um, it's not dependent on you having like a certain style of working out. Um, no matter what type of books you're into, I mean, Audible is going to have those books. So it's, it's going to be something that anybody can literally use, no matter what kind of things that you're into. Um, and the other good thing about Audible, too, is that um, I found with a lot of sponsors, it's difficult to make um repeated content like to make a video every single month for a sponsor can be very challenging to make oh you can't you can't do it exactly. you know even 
even I, you know, I've been with BSN for six years now as one of their athletes, and they they had just recently sent an email saying they wanted us to do seven posts a week, and I was like, you know, obviously I can tag I tag BSN all the time in my because I use the products every day, you know, whether it's my protein or amino X or creatine, glutamine, whatever, but people they don't they know I use it and if they see it once a week that's enough and if you start doing it all the time it's actually turning them it's making them used to it I guess you know there's probably a better word to say like it, it loses its impact you know what I mean like oh Scott's using BSN again who get who cares you know but if it's been like a week you know oh I'm gonna gonna crush this synthesis BSN shake boom they're like oh yeah I like synthesis I should buy some more you know what I mean? It, do you guys agree? How do you do it, though, weekly? I mean, television does it, radio does it, and they don't seem to get in trouble with it. Is there a way to have maybe a – It's a different – uh, It's a different I, space. I, oh, the the oh, so I'll let you go, Daniel. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think the biggest thing, um, uh, for example, with the Audible thing, um, what we do for Audible is that um, rather than just saying, like, go to audible.com and buy the book – um, we review a different book every week, and then um, we say, you know, if you're like us and you find reading difficult, you can just listen to this book in your car and go to audible.com. Um, so I, I would say that's the biggest thing, like trying to find some type of content where it, it's legitimately something that people want to see, even if they didn't buy from the country. Um, thinking about something like that has been the biggest key for us. Yeah. Well, if you have it at the end of your video – oh, sorry, Abel. Well, I was just going to say, so doing longer form content as well, even though you might have the same – promotion you want to make sure that you're saying it in a different and interesting way and i think that's straight to dan's point where if you're making a, a creative effort to sell something in a unique way in a way that values them they're not going to tune out but as soon as you hear that you know auto roll come on no matter what that content is i you know we said that traditional media doesn't really get in trouble for advertising that way. But i think they're starting to get uh, into a lot of trouble getting the ROI that they used to because now there's an alternative where you have someone like Scott or someone like Dan or someone like me talking about something that they specifically were searching for, which is fundamentally different than like sitting on your couch, couch watching football and getting a car commercial or something like that. You know what I mean? Now, Abel, Abel, you've got a podcast too, right? So yeah. what's the difference between YouTube for brands and podcast for brands? It used to be very different, you know, and I, the vast majority of my following comes from Apple and podcasting and Stitcher and that that whole thing. But a few years ago, I started basically just turning my webcam on and cross promoting that on YouTube a little bit, basically because it was already there for Apple podcasting, where I was getting tons of traction. Uh, and a lot of it was organic within Apple because it ranks so high in the charts. But as you know, it becomes uh, as it basically it got flooded with a bunch of different people. Same thing that, you know, six pack ab type workouts or chest workouts, all of a sudden, People aren't looking for the information anymore. They're looking for a credible source to come back to. So it's become harder to measure that because a lot of people who are buying my products now, they're saying, you know, I've been following you for three, four, five years. And this is the first time that I've ever had that sort of interaction with you. So you can't measure that at the beginning of the contact with the person you're marketing to. Now it's coming way down the road because they're coming back, not just for the chest workout, but also for what should I, what should I be eating for breakfast? You know, what sort of fitness gear do I want? They're coming back to that personality because it's a place that they trust to get their information. Okay. Well so said. I will say, um, and I'm going to ask each of you after this question, but I will say YouTube for us has been far more effective than podcasts for as a market or a brand perspective, right? Maybe not awareness, maybe podcasts are better, but can you guys, and you guys are multi-channel, can you guys think of a better platform than YouTube for brands right now? Is there anything better out there? I YouTube is number one. You have like if you want to grow your your social media, you need to be on YouTube and you need to be able to get creative and come up with content because unfortunately we live in a world where everybody wants to touch you every single day and they want this like reality show and they want to see you and your personality, what you wear, what you eat, what you do. You know what I mean? So that doesn't come across well in a Facebook post or a Twitter post. You know what I mean? Unless you're like in movies and you have a bazillion followers, you know, then it's just a built in marketplace right there. But if you're trying to grow your brand in yourself and your personality, you got to show your personality. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's specifically for Dan and Abel and back to Scott, 
Is there anything better for sales for brands? I mean, when if a brand puts out their product on your YouTube channels, let's say you authentically like it, it's in your own voice, you're doing less than infomercial and just talking about what you like about the product. Is there anything better out there than YouTube for, for, for brands to sell products? I well, mean, personally, I, I really don't think so. And um, I mean, I know, you know, it's a little self-serving because we all sell like the sponsor videos here, but I also, you know, we have multiple channels. Yeah, you have multiple uh, channels, so. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, um, uh, what, what is it? it just because what, what, what Scott and Abel were saying, like YouTube, first of all, it's the most visual. It's um, uh, growing the past. It's a network effect. Um, it probably there's never going to be any other video side as dominant as YouTube. I, I would say the only um, the only platform I say comes close is uh, Facebook. I would say pretty much everybody needs to be on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, but the ability to buy a sponsored video on YouTube, um, to have advertising that you pay for once, which generates sales on a permanent basis, I, I think is very, very compelling. Well, you guys can always go to my site, musculostrength.com. I take cash, check, money order, you know, and I'll put you right in the home page. And we can just, you know, move on from there. <laughs> nice pitch, Scott. Abel, what do you think about YouTube? What do you think about YouTube, too? <laughs> you know, like for channels like ours that have a lot of subscribers, our reach is exponentially bigger than most people. And the way the algorithms work on YouTube, you know, it, it's, it's much more, it would be much better opportunity for a company to put money behind a video on one of our channels because our, we have such a big reach already. You know, we're all like close to a million subscribers, Mark. So to have a YouTube channel with like a thousand subscribers and you put five grand behind a video to push it out, you know, you're not gonna get the same reach as you would if that same video was on my channel with the same money. And also whenever you do YouTube marketing, there's no point in marketing a video unless it's sending you somewhere. So if you're trying to market a product and you want me to put a video on my channel and you're going to put money behind that and you're going to advertise it, there has to be links, whether it's doing the I cards that pop out or in the info section, like there has to be links somewhere that's going to send the viewer to where that product is or else the video is useless. So yep, if you're just going to do a review and be like, oh, this product's great. I'm, I, I just teamed up with this company. They're amazing. We're going to be working together and there's no link to send you somewhere. You know, if the video might get 100,000 views, but the, how many of those people actually went to see the product? You know, so that's why YouTube is so powerful, especially if you already have a big channel. And you're jumping ahead a little bit, Scott, but that was a great answer, by the way. Abel, any, any comments on that? I would just echo what, what Scott said. In a lot of ways, the power of the internet and new media is the fact that you can say, hey, this is great, click here, right? Then they go directly to whatever that thing was. And as from a video perspective, you have to be on YouTube. There really isn't any other alternative. This is, for me, and especially getting so much traction in the Apple marketplace, being on YouTube in large part was an afterthought and I would just kind of throw stuff up there. And now for someone like you saying that you found me there, right? I'm getting a lot of feedback recently that is saying people are, are using this, new people are using YouTube as a way to find content and as a way to find things that they're very willing to buy. Uh, not just information, but products as well. So it's if you're not using some sort of link on your videos then you're missing out on the whole power of YouTube. Yeah, my, my whole thing about YouTube, what I love and what people don't think about when they run other types of campaigns, even on Facebook, is that YouTube is the second biggest search engine. Your videos about my brand's products that we represent sit there forever. So they're constantly being found. And since you guys are so popular, they end up being on page one. So there's tremendous SEO value for brands that they don't factor in to marketing on YouTube. I, I think everyone should be marketing on YouTube as much as possible and working with guys like you, assuming that they, you're in their niche. Well, uh, to the needle. especially with Facebook, I mean, as soon as you put a link in a Facebook post, they just destroy you, you know? And I, for one, am, am just getting more and more frustrated because I've spent, you know, hours and hours and hours of my life for the past six years building a huge community on Facebook and now every single time I post a link for Facebook to drop the hammer and, and, you know, less than half of a percentage of my fans see my comments, why would I ever want to put money into Facebook, you know? And then if you put money behind a Facebook post, they're like, oh, you can boost your post and you'll reach, you know, 2 million people with $1,000 behind your post. And it's like, okay, 
who are these two million people? Is it grandma? All the grandmas that signed up to my page? Like, you know, so Facebook is really making it hard to, to stay in touch with your community, but, fa but YouTube isn't. And YouTube will always be number one, as much as Facebook tries to copy them. Facebook should shoot themselves in the foot. I mean, do you guys agree? Do you find Definitely. that you get the same issues? Yeah, um, we're we find that um, on the community side, definitely. We, we do we do do very well just in terms of advertising and making sales. Um, one thing, though, I, I would say on the on the uh, YouTube side, one of the biggest advantages of YouTube, I think, is that um, it, it's a part of Google. And Google, in my opinion, has by far the best advertising technology of any network out there. Um, one thing that's worked really well for us is um, one, uh, a concept called uh, remarketing and uh, remarketing the people who have watched our videos. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with that, basically remarketing is um, you place a cookie on somebody's computer, uh, say if they watch a certain video about getting abs, um, and then you can show them uh, ads afterwards um, and kind of like follow them around the internet. Um, and one big thing that's worked a lot for us is um, targeting the ads to um, what type of video somebody's watched. Uh, for example, if someone's watching videos about muscle building, it makes sense to show them ads about muscle building. If they're watching videos about fat loss, it makes sense to show them uh, ads about fat loss. So um, I would say, too, um, basically showing somebody an organic video makes them perceive you differently. You're not perceived as a corporation. You're perceived as um, – uh, as, as a friend and as a trainer. Um, and once you have that perception, showing them the ads, once you've shown them you have the goods, I think can be uh, very effective. So Daniel, you're remarketing right on YouTube? Yeah, exactly. Um, we do, uh, basically a lot of our campaigns, the way they go is somebody will see an organic video, um, say if it's about fat loss, and then we try to show them targeted ads, um, uh, either in screen or in display ads about fat loss. Okay, great. All right, let's go to the next uh, topic. This is one of my favorites. What are the specific tips and tricks for brands that you tell them when they want to promote their products on your channels? Now, Scott's already brought up about embedded links and, and all that on YouTube, but is there any other specific tips that you guys have really seen move the needle versus some something that uh, brands aren't doing today? Like a hack, you guys YouTube hacks. I mean, I think the biggest thing for us is um, I, uh, most advertisers, what they want us to do is they want us to link to some kind of landing page and make sales. And I mean, I can I can identify with that. I'm an advertiser myself, and it's very tempting to want to make your money back right away. Um, I, I think the, the better return on investment, though, is people on YouTube, that they, they want to stay on YouTube and they want to get more YouTube content. I, I think it would be better for most advertisers to try to um, make the call to action in the, in the sponsored video to go to the advertiser's channel and to subscribe. Um, most people are not going to just buy your product right away off the sponsor video. Some people might, but the majority of people, they're going to need to see four or five videos and know that you're the real deal before, before buying. Okay. Abel? I would echo that. You need to, you know, for a personal brand to link to a corporation, that's pretty cold, right? It doesn't work that way. But if you're linking to another person who sells a product that you believe in or another personality, another thing that's similar to what you're doing, then that works, right? If there's more content there, that's maybe say, I don't do six pack workouts or whatever, I might link to Dan and he might be selling something. You know what I mean? So I think for brands, it's more of the, the model where you need to have an actual leader who believes in what you're doing, or you need to have some sort of personality that they can resonate with if you want to get the full impact of YouTube and other new media platforms, because you can do it the other way. You can definitely have any of us talk about one particular thing, but if I'm just saying prunes are great, go buy prunes from this prune company, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't fit. It doesn't work that well. Yeah. And if, if the product really is, you know, cohesive with what you're doing, then there shouldn't be any reason why, you know, you, 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 for example, like I could, I could take my sculpt and I could just start off a video. Hey, I'm going to measure my body fat and then just do it. And then not even really talk about what, I, what it is or what I'm doing because I won't need to, because it's a part of my weekly regimen. Let's see what my body fat is this week, you know? And, oh, look, I gained some fat because I ate too much. Or I go, oh, I, I feel better because I did extra cardio. And, you, and you know, it, 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 you're using it and you're telling people you use it. You're telling people it's something that you will use all the time. So there's no need to be like, oh, I'm going to measure my body fat with this. You know what I mean? Because then you're starting to sell. Even when I was a personal trainer, I never sold training to people. I just helped them get into shape and I would take them on the floor and I would put them through a workout and I'd be like, did you like that? Do you want to do more? All right, let's go do more. You know what I mean? And it's not even like you're trying to trick someone. It's not like you're, doing, you're not trying to do a soft sell. It's just a part of your lifestyle. 
So it's natural. And that's what companies need to understand. They're getting a lot better at it. I would say a few years ago, I would get approached by companies to do marketing and they're like, you have to do this Twitter post, you have to do this Facebook post, you have to do this. And I'm like, whoa, bro. We'll do like a tenth of that and we'll do much better because it needs to be streamlined and organic and it has to work. Okay. Any other specific tips for brands to be successful on YouTube? Have you seen a brand come to each of you guys and say, hey, let's let's link to one another and to the corporation in the, you know, some kind of a, a let me come, I'm in integrated fashion. So Abel does a video. At the end of it, it says, go see what Scott thinks. And at the end of that, it's like, go see what Six Pack Abs uh, thinks. Have you guys you'd ever be, been a part of something like that? Yeah. You'd be, you'd be better off making one video and having us all just put the content together. I, in guys, my opinion, how do you I think, I guess getting you all in the same room isn't required when you can do the, the video post editing, right? Yeah. And I mean, you can, you can make the video more interesting by going back and forth. You know, I think linking is a great idea too, but if you really want to make sure people see like Abel or Daniel and myself, then we, we should make a video together you know, and just divide the content up and have it into one video and then be like, hey, if you want to see more from these people here, I mean, do you guys agree? Yeah, I agree with that. Where would it be posted? Well, that's the thing, you know, you could just collaborate and do videos like say one could go on Abel's channel and then a few weeks later one goes on my channel. Do you know what I mean? You just have to not be greedy with views and think, oh my God, now Abel's going to get all the credit and I did all this work. Well, it's like, well, then one day I'll get the credit. You know what I mean? It, it, it has to be streamlined and organic and it just has to work and make sense. And you can't, you know, get all upset if you're not getting all the views. Well, it's like, I'm now, if I, if my, my, if I'm on a video on Abel's channel, I'm now being introduced to his audience, you know, and, and yeah. there's no way to really track how many of those people come to my channel, but it's introducing me to people who might not know about me and vice versa. So there's always a benefit to a video going on someone else's channel and they get maybe a million views, but now at least a million people know who I am. And it's right. people you want to be following you, right? They're all yes. in that specific thing, which really matters. You don't want views. You want the right views. And when you're collaborating with, with people like that or with brands like that, you're both growing together. A good example that started off as, as nothing, just a guy with coffee in his backpack in the past few years to being huge now is bulletproof. And Dave Asprey is a guy who, yeah. you know, I, I know personally as a friend and it's been fascinating because we collaborated at the beginning a lot on the, just let's sit down and make a weird video side of things. And, you know, skip ahead, it has hundreds, of, like a lot of these videos that were a total afterthought back then have hundreds of thousands of views, sometimes more than that, just because they've been on the channel for a long time. And meanwhile, we've been able to build a multi-million dollar brand really around small community of people who just believed in the same thing it's unbelievable what he's done i i would say one thing i want to share too that um i, I think was brilliant that uh gq magazine did with us when we did a collaboration um like scott was saying they, they weren't too focused on where it went they actually put the video on our channel but one thing that you can do in adwords now is you can advertise videos on other channels assuming the um the, the person who owns a video gives you permission so they advertised a video on our channel and they sent us actually millions of views uh, for free from advertising um where we're definitely not complaining about that um from their point of view um the reason why that was so good is that when it shows up as an ad it shows up as as six-pack shortcut so people assume you know it's going to be a, a fitness workout video right away um so that's something that i'm looking to actually do myself with uh, other channels um, and I'd recommend that to other brands as well. Um, if if you can get the ad to show up on the channel of the content creator, it's going to be perceived a totally different way than if it's on the corporate channel. Can you walk me through that? Because I didn't quite catch that. So you're, are you talking about using AdWords to put your ad on somebody else or a brand's ad on your channel? Yeah. Basically, what we did is um, if you look back, if you search for GQ on our channel, we did a, a collaboration with GQ Magazine. Um, and what they did is they advertised a video which was on our channel, which is actually technically possible through AdWords. Um, and the benefit of that for them is the video got a much higher view rate because it was um, seen as being a part of our channel. Um, and because the video was co-branded, they actually built up those subscribers a lot now too. How did their video show up on your channel? That's what I don't understand. Through AdWords? Uh, well, they, they filmed the video and they made it for us and then they gave it to us to post on our channel. Got it. I mean, we, we, it was an excellent, excellent deal for us and it worked out real well for them too. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right, guys. Uh, 
One last question before we wrap things up. What are the challenges in working with brands? What don't they understand? If you're, you're, to, you're talking directly to them right now, what do you want them to know about, you know, and what, what are brands asking you to do that are simply uh, ill-advised? I think, <laughs> I think what brands need to do before they put together their marketing plan is talk to one of us because they're just going to waste a lot of time in trying to figure out what our communities want. So if a marketing brand wants to work with Abel or myself or Daniel, they're better off saying, hey, we like this person for these core reasons and let's contact them and then discuss what we should do, what the ideas are before any real time gets put into this marketing that they're gonna do. Okay. Yeah, you also need to know what those people do, right? Like you need, <laughs> yeah. if you're going, <laughs> I get so many emails and so many people reaching out, they're just like, hey, fat burning man, love your show. Will you advertise this fat burning pill for me? And it's like, don't you realize that on every show I'm making fun of fat burning pills? <laughs> and so you need, you need to know what they're doing. And also I think it helps to send your product way ahead of time, you know, a month or two, maybe a quarter ahead of time. So they get the chance to, to use that product for three months to build their own talking points instead of saying, sell this thing, this is how you do it. It's like, no, it really, ha if it's coming from a personality, if it's coming from one channel, people need that to come from the heart. It needs to be something that's real. So the best way to do that is by getting your product in their hands and even before that, making it a product that they would want in their hands. You need to truly think about the people who will be selling on your behalf. Okay. Yeah, I would say I would echo what these guys are saying. The biggest mistake that I've seen brands do is they, they send us like a script um, or like something that they send out to everybody. Um, uh, one example, I mean, uh, one of our best sponsors right now is uh, Harry's Razors. Um, and and we, we love Harry's, but uh, the, the very first video that they did for us, they were very insistent that there was a, um, a scripted part that they just had to get read. Um, and for the first one, we understood, you know, it's the first time working with us. Um, but once we were able to establish a track record, they were able to give us a little bit more creative control. And um, as a result of that, the videos that, that we made after that actually worked a lot better. Um, so I know I can, from a marketer's point of view, it can kind of sound like some social media hippie stuff to be saying all this thing. Um, but if you see a channel with a track record of people buying the sponsored videos over and over again, there's a reason for that. So I would give the um, the content creator a little more creative control if they have a good track record. I guess you could give a, a bad example. Have you guys seen like that detox tea? Like everyone's like, oh my God, I lost 10 pounds with this detox tea. And there's like all these photos of like different models and stuff, like chilling at the beach with their detox tea right next to them, you know, and it's like, detox tea doesn't make you lose fat, but that's what they're marketing it as. And, and like my Instagram feed was blowing up with everyone and their mom, like, oh my God, I love this detox tea. It's so amazing. And it was like the same cookie cutter thing. Do you know what I mean? That was being said. And then for people who contact us for, for sponsors and whatnot, it's so funny when you get an email and the top line says like, hey, Scott, in like a different font. And then the bottom is just like pasted in and it's like <laughs> one font size smaller. And you know that it's just like they just paste that to every single person that they're marketing to. I don't even read those emails, you know, half the time. I'm like, all right, this is junk. I'm not even going to deal with this. If you can't take the time to contact me and actually, you know, talk about what I do, like, hey, Scott, we have this amazing product. We saw a few of your, few of your videos and we think that you would be great for us for like – Show some investment in us if you're going to reach out to us, you know? It's like, it's almost like an insult to just have someone email you and then just literally paste something in and then move on to the next guy. Don't you guys agree? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think um, basically like that, that is the approach a lot of brands take where they try to just get like one sponsor video and it's kind of like one and done. Um, and for us, you know, that could be a way to make like quick 30 grand and for the brand to make some quick money, too. But I feel that the real money in YouTube sponsorships is made from long term relationships. When you find somebody who's, um, uh, you know what I mean, that you're comfortable like selling a sponsor video to over and over again, that your subscribers like, like each one gets a better and better response and where the brand is doing well. That's really should be the goal. Um, so I would say, I, I mean, if you're looking for a model, I think the best in the game right now is Audible. Um, Audible sponsorships are really well received. They never, never get a bad reaction. And I know for sure they're making a lot of money from it. So study what they're doing and, and do the same thing. I actually have a few friends that listen to Audible while they work out. And I had never thought to do that before. And I was like, man, I could probably do that. Get some extra cardio. Because I like to go for runs outside. I like to do cardio, obviously. 
I was like, man, I could listen to some books, you know, and get a little bit smarter. That would be great. <laughs> I never right. thought of doing that before, you know, because usually it's like, no, I need my rock tunes, you know. <laughs> but it, yeah, so that's a good Audible. point. If Audible's listening, there's there's three gentlemen here that want to talk to you. Well, Dan, you already. <laughs> Yeah, well, I would just like to say thanks to all the people who are on the call. And, you know, I just noticed these hands that like go up all the time. So it looks like everyone has been liking what we're saying. So I just want to say thank you to all of you guys who've joined the call and, you know, given us your, your, your hands of approval. <laughs> awesome. Abel, anything, uh, anything else to wrap things up? Well, I, I would like to say thank you to everyone who's watching right now, because it, like what Scott said, it, it matters. You know, if you're trying to work with people like us, then make it a personal relationship. Make it a long-term relationship. It's not about some, you know, little tip or little tactic or whatever that's going to make the difference. YouTube is going to be around a long time. So are influencers like us. So build those relationships. That's what's going to make the difference. Yep. All I right. agree 100%. Uh, and I'll just wrap things up. I haven't seen a better, more effective, most cost-effective approach for advertisers and brands to get their work, their message out as, as well as sales than through YouTube. I haven't seen anything out there. Maybe possibly Pinterest, depending on what the product is. But for us, because of the SEO value of YouTube, YouTube is prime. And these are three guys that are prime examples of how to make that uh, work effectively. So thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. This will be posted on our YouTube channel and then on Forbes in the next uh, couple of weeks. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mike.